Hi, I'm Dr. Daniel C. I'm an interventional radiologist with a special interest in interventional oncology, which is image-guided treatment of tumors. I'd like to talk to you about some of the more recent progress that we've made in treating tumors, particularly ones that affect the liver. This includes tumors that start in the liver, such as hepatocellular carcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma, as well as metastatic tumors that started somewhere else, such as in the colon or the lung or the breast, that metastasize to the liver. Unfortunately, as you know, by the time that tumors are identified in the liver, in the vast majority of cases, it's already too late for liver transplantation or for surgical resection to be curative in these patients. What we can offer in interventional radiology is a more targeted approach not so much molecularly targeted, but spatially or anatomically targeted. Our theory is that why poison the entire body with chemotherapy if the tumor really lives in the liver? So let's concentrate whatever therapy that is designed to kill tumors to be directed only at the tumors where they live in the liver. What is radioembolization? Radioembolization is a, is a long fancy word. There are other uh, words or terms that are used to describe this as well, including selective internal radiation therapy. Sometimes it's also known by the trade names, surspheres or Therospheres, which are two uh, uh, competing products that are offered. Radioembolization represents a new uh, method of delivering radiation, very high doses of radiation to tumors. For the past 30 or 40 years, radiation therapy of tumors of the liver has been uh, off limits, primarily because the liver itself is sensitive to radiation. So that by the time we give enough radiation to the tumor to kill the tumor, the liver has also received so much radiation that it gets sick as well. And as you can well imagine, a sick liver is not a good thing. Radioembolization, though, represents an entirely different way of delivering radiation. Rather than shining radiation from outside of the body, what we do is we actually inject radioactive microspheres that go inside the body. They are carried by the blood flow going into the liver and selectively lodge in the tumors and irradiate these tumors from the inside. The radioactive source that we use is an isotope called yttrium-90. By itself, yttrium-90 is bioinert, meaning it doesn't react with any of the chemicals of the body. The yttrium-90 is actually encapsulated in these plastic or glass microspheres, which are permanent. They stay in the body and never leave. But for several days to several weeks after deposition of these microspheres in the tumors, the yttrium-90 gives off a type of radiation that is called beta irradiation or beta particles, which are actually just electrons. The reason why we use yttrium-90 is that it only gives off these beta particles and doesn't give off any other type of radiation. The beta particles are of a high energy but are unable to penetrate much tissue. So the only tissue that receives radiation is a very small amount, about two and a half millimeters of tissue that surround the actual microsphere where it was deposited. So if we deposit this radiation in the tumor, the nearby liver does not get much radiation and the other parts of the body essentially get no radiation. Who can be considered for this procedure? The process of undergoing radioembolization unfortunately is rather long and, and very technical. So as a patient, the first step would be to send your information or have your uh, physician send information uh, to a center that specializes in radioembolization, such as our center here at Stanford University. There are very defined criteria about who is a good candidate for radioembolization and who is potentially too ill to benefit from radioembolization. In our evaluation, even before seeing you, even before seeing the patient, we first like to look at a CT scan or a PET scan or an MRI scan in order to see where the tumors are, how many there are, how large they are, 
whether they are only in the liver or also have spread outside the liver. And we'd also like to know where these tumors came from originally, whether they started in the liver itself or whether they migrated there from somewhere else. Secondly, we also need to evaluate the overall health of the patient. So a person, for instance, who was so weakened by cancer and the therapies that they've received for cancer, that he or she is unable to get out of bed is unlikely to benefit from a therapy like radioembolization, which is quite an aggressive therapy. Lastly, we also want to look at the health of the actual liver. So basically the host organ that unfortunately has these unwanted visitors uh, that are squatting, these, these tumors that are squatting in the liver. Eventually, these tumors can get so large that they stress out the liver and the function of the liver is compromised. What we need to determine is whether the liver is still healthy enough to withstand the aggressive radiation that we give it. So not only looking at the uh, CAT scan or MRI scan or PET scan, we also need to look at the laboratory blood tests that are capable of measuring whether the liver, whether the background liver, is still healthy enough to withstand an aggressive treatment. Will this cure me of my cancer? Radioembolization is a valuable tool in our armamentarium against the fight of liver cancer. Nevertheless, it is not a cure. There are very, very few people that have their liver, liver tumors completely eradicated. Radioembolization, we hope, can eliminate about 80 or 90 percent of the living tumor cells in the liver. Unfortunately, the 10 or 20 percent that are left behind will continue to grow. This means that it's not a one-stop shop, that even after receiving radioembolization, you should keep in contact with your referring oncologist and other physicians, because you may need chemotherapy and other adjunctive therapies. What if I'm already undergoing chemo treatment? If you're already on chemotherapy, you may wonder whether you are a candidate for radioembolization. In general, radioembolization does not interfere with chemotherapies and vice versa. There are a few exceptions to this, though, and you will need to ask your physicians about whether you need to interrupt temporarily your chemotherapy course if you are to receive radioembolization. In particular, there is one medication called Avastin which is very effective against many cancers, including metastatic cancers from the colon and rectum that have spread to the liver, and it is in fact FDA approved for this application. However, Avastin works by decreasing the size and number of blood vessels that lead to tumors. And in, during radioembolization, we actually exploit these large and numerous blood vessels to help carry the radiation into the tumors. And so these two uh, modalities of treatment actually do fight each other. What happens after my paperwork has been received? After receiving the information from you in terms of the laboratory test results describing the function of the liver, as well as the imaging re uh, results of how many and how large the tumors are, we will then arrange to see you in our clinic so that we can talk in person about whether you are a good candidate for radioembolization. We will also be able to talk at that time about what you can expect in the ensuing weeks about when to be at the hospital, how you're going to feel, as well as what sort of help you may need at home before and after the treatment. This visit to our clinic will last approximately one hour and you will be seen by either me or one of my colleagues that is also skilled at radioembolization. In addition, you will see one of our nurse practitioners who will be able to uh, advise you and to manage many of the issues that surround your cancer therapy. What happens next after my clinic visit? After seeing us in clinic, we will then contact you to arrange a mutually agreeable date for your first angiogram. Unlike some of the other intra-arterial therapies that we offer, like chemoembolization, radioembolization is actually a two-day process. The first day is a very long day full of tests to determine whether you really are a good candidate for radioembolization 
and also to calculate what is the maximum amount of radiation that we can actually give to your liver and to the tumors that reside within it. This first day of tests, you will be asked to arrive at the hospital very early in the morning. You will be asked not to eat anything after midnight the night before. The reason why we ask you to come with an empty stomach is not because the hospital cafeteria has such great food, but it's because during the procedure we will be giving you medications to take the edge off any discomfort you may have and also to let you sleep through most of it. Unfortunately, one of the common side effects of one of these medications is that people can get an upset stomach. After arriving at the hospital, we will place an intravenous line so that we can give you medications through uh, your veins. The angiogram itself will last several hours. First, we numb up a spot in the groin area and under ultrasound and x-ray guidance, we snake a long skinny catheter up through the, the arteries into the artery that supplies blood to the liver. There are at least three things that we want to figure out about your anatomy. The first thing is even though there are patterns of arteries that we call normal, in fact only about half of the people in the world have what we call normal anatomy. The other half have extra arteries so that rather than one main highway going into the liver, there may be several other side roads going into the liver as well. The reason why this is important is that when it comes time to treating the tumors, we don't want to treat half the tumors. We, in fact, we don't want to miss any of the tumors. So we need to obtain a very detailed map of every single artery that is feeding blood to the tumors in the liver. In fact, if we find any of these small side roads, frequently we will intentionally block them up with what are called embolization coils. These are tiny little platinum devices that look like microscopic inchworms that we place into the artery to occlude them or to block them permanently. This way, all of the traffic or all of the blood going into the liver is then forced to go through the main highway. A second thing that we want to look for in this first angiogram is that everyone has blood vessels that connect the liver to its surrounding organs, including the stomach, the pancreas, and the duodenum. The stomach, the pancreas, and the duodenum are very, very intolerant of receiving any radiation. And we certainly don't want to accidentally deposit any radiation in any of the neighboring organs. So, during your first angiogram, we will be very, very uh, meticulous about looking for these very small blood vessels that connect the liver to its surroundings. When we find these connections, again, we have to place medical corks into these blood vessels, these corks that we call embolization coils, to block these communications permanently so that when it is time to deposit radioactive substances into the liver, none of it spills over into the stomach or the duodenum or other parts of the small intestine or the pancreas. At the end of the procedure, we will actually give a test injection of a very, very small amount of a radioactive substance. This test injection is of a standardly used nuclear medicine substance called technetium MAA, which is used as a tracer. The reason why we do this test injection is that we want to confirm that when it's time to do the treatment and deposit the real high dose radiation, that we will be absolutely sure that it only goes where we want it to go. This test injection is of such a small amount of radiation that it won't affect anything. It's far too little radiation to actually treat any of the tumors, but it's only used as a tracer. After the angiography is completed and the test injection is completed, we will then remove our catheters and we usually use something called a closure device, which is a small permanent metallic clip that pinches closed the hole that we made in your blood vessel in the groin region. This will help to prevent any accidental bleeding and will also allow you to get out of bed in a more timely fashion rather than stay in bed for a long period of time waiting for that hole to heal. After we're finished with the angiography, you will then proceed to the nuclear medicine department where they will scan your entire body, in particular looking at the lungs and the liver and its surroundings. 
what they're doing is looking to see where that test injection went. And we, of course, hope that the large majority of it stays in the liver and actually is concentrated in the tumors. A little bit of it will always leak out of the liver, and the next place that it will be deposited would be the lungs. And the lungs are not tolerant of radiation either. So from these pictures that the nuclear medicine department takes, we then calculate how much of the radiation ex is expected to stay in the tumors, how much is expected to go into the normal liver that houses these tumors, and how much leaks out of the liver and is lodged in the, in the lungs. We then crunch these numbers to determine, first of all, whether it's safe at all to do radioembolization on you, and secondly, if it is safe to do, what is the maximum amount of radiation that we can give safely? Of course, what we would like to do is kill the most tumor that we can, and in order to do so, we try to maximize the amount of radiation that we actually give. What should I expect on my second visit? On your second visit to us, you will actually be treated with the radioactive yttrium-90. This is usually one to two weeks after your first visit. You won't be required to stay 12 hours. It'll be about half that many hours. But just like with the first day, you will first come to the hospital, register, we'll have you take off your clothes and put on a hospital gown, and we will place an IV into a vein so that we can administer medications. The androgram will feel much the same, except that it'll be quicker, because by now we will know what your arteries look like, and we will be able to go to the exact spot in your liver artery very quickly. Once we get there, we usually do a double check to make sure that there are no branches of this artery that lead to any of the neighboring organs, like the intestines or pancreas or stomach. When we're absolutely sure that it is safe to give the radioactive substances, then we deposit it over a period of about 15 to 20 minutes. The vast majority of people never feel anything. Some people do feel some pain in the region of the liver, and some people have an upset stomach. And because of that, we actually give everyone medications to combat any nausea or pain that they may have. After we're done giving the radioactive substance, we put a Geiger counter on your liver to measure how much radioactivity there actually is in there. And then we pull out our catheters again and place another closure device, a little metal clip that pinches close the hole that we placed in your blood vessel. You will be required to stay in the hospital only about two hours afterwards to make sure that there's no bleeding from the groin site. And after that, you go home. When should I follow up with my doctor? In terms of follow-up, two weeks after your treatment, we will have you uh, obtain blood tests either here at Stanford Hospital or if it's more convenient at a hospital or site nearer to your home. As long as we receive the results of these tests, you don't absolutely need to come back to Stanford Hospital. One month after treatment though, we do have you come back to the hospital so that I can see you and we can go over what has been happening since your treatment. We want to make sure that there have not been any unexpected side effects. We then get more lab tests at one month and two months and at three months to see whether we've had the desired effect on your tumors and also to make sure that there have not been any bad side effects on the liver. We usually obtain a repeat CT scan or MRI scan or PET scan about two to three months after treatment because that's when we really see the results of our treatment. For the first few weeks or even the first month or so, we actually expect the tumors to get larger. If you do get a CT scan or an MRI scan during that first month, don't be afraid of the report that the tumors are larger or more numerous because that is expected. The tumors are in fact angry or, or irritated that we've deposited so much radiation in them. How would this treatment affect my liver? So you may wonder that if we deposit radioactive substances into the liver, why is it that these treat the tumors and don't kill the entire liver? We exploit one of the one of the unique properties of the liver in that unlike other parts of the body, the liver receives blood from two different sources. The main source, supplying two-thirds to three-quarters of the blood to the liver, is called the portal vein. The portal vein carries all of the blood out of the intestines and stomach into the liver for the first pass filtration and processing 
of all the food and nutrients that you've absorbed through those parts of the body. Portal venous blood is muddy. It has basically your dissolved Big Mac in it. And most parts of the liver love this kind of blood because that's the function of the liver, is to clean up this blood and to absorb the nutrients. About one third or one quarter of the blood flow to the liver though comes in the form of the highly oxygenated, bright red, high pressure blood from the hepatic artery, which comes straight from the heart. Tumors don't like portal venous blood. They just don't like the Big Mac mixed into it. What they want is the high test, super premium gasoline that they can get from the artery. That's high pressure, has a lot of oxygen in it. And in fact, any tumors that are large enough to see by CT scan or MRI are almost exclusively fed by the hepatic artery. Because of this, when we deposit these radioactive microspheres into the hepatic artery, they preferentially go to the tumors. Some will go to the background liver, but the amount that goes to the background liver is relatively small. So the deposition of the radiation within the liver and within the tumors is not uniform. In general, the tumors get a lot more radiation than the background liver. And that is why it is safe to give large amounts of radiation this way without damaging the liver. Will I be radioactive after the procedure is completed? Now, a lot of patients that undergo radioembolization are concerned that they will be radioactive afterwards, and that's true. You will be radioactive, particularly your liver will be quite radioactive. We will calculate how radioactive you are by putting a Geiger counter up next to you. The, the, the amount of radioactivity that you will produce is not very high. Nevertheless, there are certain people in your family or in your community that may be extra sensitive or susceptible to the damaging effects of radiation. So we advise that if you have children or pregnant women in your household that you stay away from them for at least three days, I would recommend even up to a week. And by away from them, I don't mean that they need to be in another state. I mean that they need to be at least at arm's length. So the minimum precaution to take for children and for women who are pregnant after your treatment is keep them at, away at arm's length for three days. Now your spouse may wonder, well, is it even safe to take you home in the car and sit in the same car with you? Yes, it is. Adults are actually not very sensitive to the amount of radiation that you will be producing. Nevertheless, if you usually share a bed with a spouse or partner, it may be advisable for that person to stay on the couch for three days or in the guest bed for three days because I don't want even an adult to fall asleep lying on your liver. If you have to fly home or fly somewhere within the first few days after treatment, uh, nowadays the security measures taken at uh, airports do have radiation detectors. In general, these detectors are not strong enough or sensitive enough to detect any radiation coming out of your liver. But in case they do, we can provide documentation describing what treatment you have had. Will my health insurance cover this procedure? Radioembolization is a very complicated procedure, and only a few hospitals in the United States currently offer radioembolization. In fact, dozens of people, including other physicians, nurses, and technologists, all contribute to the success of your treatment. Because of this, radioembolization is very expensive, and it's so expensive that you probably can't pay for it out of your own pocket. Insurance companies in general do pay for radioembolization, but there can be some problems. Radioembolization was approved by the United States FDA for treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer after it has spread to the liver. Many of the patients that we see and we treat have cancers that started elsewhere. Either it started in the liver itself or it may have started in another organ outside of the colon. Even though these types of cancers are not exactly what the FDA approved radioembolization to treat, nevertheless, many of these tumors respond very well to radioembolization. It can take some time, though, for you and for us to gather enough paperwork and evidence to convince your insurance company that they need to pay for this treatment. The earlier we start on this paperwork, 
the more likely that we can succeed.